beginning at verse 1, chapter 12, reading to verse 3. Then Job answered and said, No doubt you are the people, and wisdom will die with you. But I have understanding as well as you. I am not inferior to you. Indeed, who does not know such things as these? And so let me remind you of a few things as we're about to enter into the study of chapter 12. Job's friend, a man by the name of Zophar, has been rebuking Job because as you've been reading with me, you've seen that Job has been complaining, very openly complaining. He'd been complaining and had gone so far as to even address his complaints to God himself. In chapter 10, chapter 10 is a complaint that is personally directed to the Lord. Well, when Job does that, that's simply too much for Zophar. And so his friend Zophar began to rebuke Job for what he would refer to as his presumption. When we look at chapter 11, verses 2 and 3, in, in those verses, he basically said, your empty, foolish speech deserves a rebuttal. The actual fact is, you're getting less than you deserve. If you were to read the second portion of verse 6, this is what he said. He said, know therefore that God exacts from you less than your iniquity deserves. You're not getting as much as you deserve. You, get, you should be hurting more than you are right now. Now, as we've been going through Zophar's um, statements and all, he speaks much truth, but his approach is one that I would say is filled with insensitivity. You see, when someone is in need of correction, gentleness and humility are very important if you're going to bring a correction to anybody. Proverbs 15, verse 1 says it like this, A soft answer turns away wrath but a harsh word stirs up anger. If you're going to bring a word of correction, a rebuke, an admonishment to somebody, but you do it with an attitude, you do it with uh, arrogance, you do it by pointing your finger and all of that, you're not going to see much fruit from that. And so far as speaking things that are, 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 in fact, many of the things he says in terms of what he's declaring to him, those things are true. He just doesn't know the heart of Job, and he doesn't know really what the situation actually is. So let us learn something. When bringing an exhortation, if you're going to be having this exhortation received, one of the things that we, if we're going to exhort and, and rebuke sometimes and correct, and, and all of us will find ourselves in a position of having to do that. So when we bring an exhortation, when we have to be one who rebukes, we need to be known as people who practice what we preach. We need to be known for our integrity. And there are a few things that are as irritating as being rebuked by someone who doesn't practice what they say. You see, when it's necessary to confront and encourage someone, one of the things that is really important is for us simply to be aware of our own sinfulness. We're no better than anybody else. When Paul was writing concerning this, if you take notes, you might want to note Romans chapter 15, verse 14. When Paul was writing concerning this, he said, Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able also to admonish one another. You are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. So when he says, I know that you are, I'm confident that you are full of goodness, Paul is speaking of of something beyond a natural goodness. He, he, he's speaking of, of something beyond that because the Bible says there's none good, no, not one. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says it like this, there is not a just man on earth who does good and doesn't sin. So he's not speaking about a natural goodness because when you look around, there are some sinners who are better than other sinners. There are some people who are better than other people and all of that. He's not speaking about natural goodness. He's speaking of something else. When he's speaking of goodness, he's speaking of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, that you're full of goodness. Goodness is one of the, uh, of the expressions of the love of God that is known as the fruit of the Spirit. If you take notes, Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says it like this. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. The fruit of the Spirit, he says, includes goodness. 
Goodness is a spiritual fruit. It's produced by a life strengthened by the Holy Spirit. It's a result of abiding in Jesus Christ, who refers to himself in John 15 as the true vine. So goodness speaks of moral and spiritual excellence. Goodness is known for its or by its service and graciousness. It's not simply moral or legal correctness. It's a manifestation, a fruit of the Spirit. And it's something that really sets you apart from those who don't know the Lord. And so one who is good is somebody who practices caring for other people. In Galatians 6, verse 10, uh, Paul said it like this. He says, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. So goodness is kindness in action, if you will. It, it's a, a moral quality, a fruit of the Holy Spirit. And so if I'm going to bring a correction to anybody, I need to have goodness. People need to look at me and say, this person practices what he preaches. But you also have to have knowledge. Now, when he speaks concerning knowledge in Romans 15, 14, it's speaking not of simply the knowledge of the world. It's not saying that you need to go uh, to, uh, to college and receive degrees that, that make you uh, better or more learned. It, it speaks of a spiritual knowledge. He says, you have moral goodness because that is a fruit of the Holy Spirit, but you also have a knowledge, a deep personal knowledge of God himself. You know God. You know his word. You know his ways. And so if you're going to bring a correction, Paul says, there needs to be moral goodness, but there also be a knowledge of God that should be there. And then finally, that gives you the ability to admonish somebody. You see, goodness and knowledge of the things of God qualify a person to admonish another. What we have with Zophar is we have a man who is able to speak and make pronouncements about God who is lacking in sympathy and compassion. There's hardly, hardly anything more difficult to handle than when somebody is bringing a correction to a person who, and that person bringing the correction is not a sympathetic person, a compassionate person. And that's what we're seeing here. Now, we've seen Aliphaz, we've seen Bildad and Zophar. And these men have all brought rebukes to Job. And so Job is now about to let them know how he feels about their arguments. And notice how he begins here in chapter chapter 12. He responds with what has been called stinging sarcasm. He makes it clear that God is behind all events, whether those events are good or evil. And he also says that in his pain, I still need to ask God why I'm suffering. So when it says in verse 1, Job answered and said, notice the sarcasm in verse 2, <laughs> no doubt you are the people and wisdom will die with you. That's a very sarcastic thing. He's saying, <laughs> Obviously, you are above every other human being on planet Earth, and all wisdom exists in you. As a matter of fact, when you die, all wisdom will cease to exist, and no one will know anything. Now, isn't that kind? You guys are know-it-alls, is what he's saying. Every one of you, <laughs> wisdom's going to die with you. It's all summed up in you. You know everything, and that's the attitude that they've been expressing or exposing to him, and it bothers him, so that's why he said, no doubt you are the people. Wisdom will die with you, but, verse 3, I have understanding as well as you. I'm not inferior to you. Indeed, who doesn't know such things as these? Notice his response. By the way, he's not boasting. He's making it clear that he already is aware of this, these things that they've said. He, he, he is saying, I have no consciousness of any inferiority to you. You aren't my teachers. You see, God is in control of everything. We know that. Who's arguing about that? You see, anyone who believes in God knows he has wisdom, knows he has power, and knows he has justice. So you're not teaching me anything I don't already know. In verse 4, I am one mocked by his friends who called on God, and he answered him, the just and blameless who is ridiculed. He's saying, you've accused me of mocking. If you were to remember in chapter 11, verse 3, it says, when you mock, should no one rebuke you. So you've accused me of being the one who is mocking, but in reality, it is you who are mocking me. As a matter of fact, Job is saying, I have become the laughingstock of my neighbors. 
Later on in chapter 19, in verses 18 and 19, Job says, Even young children despise me. I arise, and they speak against me. All my close friends abhor me, and those whom I love have turned against me. I am the laughing stock of my neighbors. I am the laughing stock of even the children in the, in the, in the city, in the village. And I am the one, notice verse 4, who called on God, and God answered. I am the just, and I really am blameless, he's saying, but I'm being ridiculed. Now, God answered my prayers, and I know that I'm just, and I know that I'm suffering in a way that, that I haven't called upon myself. I, I'm innocent, but I'm being ridiculed for something, something I haven't done. So instead of arguing with me, why not pray for me? Why not pray that I might be healed? Instead of ganging up on me, each one of you bringing your various pronouncements and your wisdom, why haven't you taken the time to pray for me? There have been times in my ministry where somebody has done something that obviously has reaper, reaped certain repercussions, produced them. I don't have to walk up and say to that person, look what you did and you're deserving everything. I don't have to do that. They're already convicted. They already know that most of the time. So what good is it going to do me to walk up to somebody and say to them, look, at, if you wouldn't have it, if you wouldn't have, and you, and that's, no. Sometimes it's just wiser and sometimes it's simply the right thing to just have a listening ear and a heart that's touched by other people's infirmities. Sometimes that is just so important. You know, the scripture says, weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. On one end of the spectrum, you have sorrow. On the other end of the spectrum, you have joy. And so you need to be somebody, Paul would say, who is able to weep with those who are hurting, but also to rejoice with the ones who have joy in their heart. It's, an, it's something that you have that goes on the whole spectrum of being a human being. And, and there are times when somebody may have done something that certainly needs to be spoken about, will be spoken about, but your initial response, if you want to be an encourager, is to learn to cry with those who cry, to learn to weep with those who weep. And so Job is trying to bring correction to them as he's speaking to them and making it very clear that what they're doing is, is not proper and it's actually well, I already know these things, but I'm one mocked by my friends. In verse 5, he says, A lamp is despised in the thought of one who is at ease. It is made ready for those whose feet slip. Uh, when he speaks about the one at ease, those who are at ease, those who are relaxing, they don't need a lamp. But the one not suffering from any misfortune is a person who sometimes doesn't understand the misfortune you're going through. And so he's saying, seeing that you are at ease, you don't understand what I'm going through. He says in verse 6, the tents of robbers prosper, and those who provoke God are secure in what God provides by his hand. And so God doesn't always act quickly against the evil one of this world. And we know that, don't we? Sometimes it seems that evil goes unchecked. And sometimes it seems that those who are doing what is really wrong, the Bible would call evil, sometimes evil people can be at rest. Sometimes evil appears to go unpunished, while righteous people seem to suffer. It seems that God sometimes puts into their hand these evil ones, opportunities to prosper even more than, than righteous people do. So you have a neighbor who has one of those bumper stickers. My kid is an honor roll student at such and so school, and they're very proud of this kid, but the kid's a bully, he's a thief, he's a liar. And you, you raise your kid to love the Lord, and he can't even spell his name the same twice in a row, and he's 16. 
He doesn't want to, he doesn't want to read. He doesn't want to study. He doesn't want to excel. You've given him devotions his whole life. You've cared for him, took him, taken him to church. You've done everything. This other kid who's neglected in every way is an honor roll student, and, and your kid, um, you know, is not. He's not excelling. And sometimes you, you, you think about it, and you think, Lord, how come? And you say, God, you know, I work. I do my best, you know, and, and, and my neighbor down the street, you know, every couple of years is driving a brand new car, and and me, when I drive my car, it's kind of like making smoke signals telling when I drive it, you know, it's just, it's falling apart. The doors are falling off. I don't even have to open them up. I just step into it. You know, what's with me? You know, I'm trying my best. I'm doing my best. And it seems that the wicked prosper and, and I, I don't have two nickels to rub together. What's going on? And, and you can do that. Sometimes it appears that those who are, who are, um, are, are, are wealthy, go, they, that they, they just go unpunished. And the, those who are doing their best to serve the Lord, it seems that they, they often suffer. But, but the point he's making is God is in control, whether it be allowing the wicked to prosper or, or even the suffering of the righteous. God is in control in what God provides by his hand. Verse 7, ask the beasts, they'll teach you. The birds of the air, they will tell you. Speak to the earth. It will teach you. The fish of the sea will explain it to you. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? So he continues, and he says, if you could only speak to nature, nature itself would reveal that God is absolute ruler. He says in verse 8, speak to the earth. The earth has a message it gives in its seasons. We have the summer, the winter. We have what is called seed time. We have harvest, and, and it, in this, this demonstrates in its order that, uh, that there is an intelligence behind it, that God is behind everything. Remember that Zophar has just told Job that God's ways are unsearchable. But Job is simply saying, you, you don't need to go to heaven or hell. You can observe this on the earth. You can see this. Observe the beast. Observe the birds, the earth itself, fish. They all are the witness of creation. In Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, Paul said this. He said, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because, listen, what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. If you take notes, there are two things that he points to when he's speaking in Romans 1, 18 through 20. One is saying there's a witness within themselves. That's another, another way of speaking of your conscience. That people have a conscience that can accuse them or excuse them. The conscience is not the Holy Spirit. The conscience is a moral code that you have that you can violate. So he says, there's a witness in you, meaning that it is possible to know something's wrong with you because your own conscience rebels. It tells you it was wrong for you to do that to that person. It was wrong for you to steal that. It was wrong for you. That's your conscience. So he says that there are two basic ways that, that, that you can know there is a God. One is your conscience because there's something inside of you that wants to do right but doesn't. And then second, the witness of creation. As you look out, you see that every house is built by some man, but he who built all things is God. And so the witness of creation. I've had fathers who have accompanied their wife into the um, delivery room. I did that several times, and I've had fathers who have said that when, they, when the baby parted the womb, they said they were just, when they woke up after fainting, they said, they said, there is a God. We used to call it the wonder of childbirth to see that ugly 
little thing bounce out. And they, their little hands are all like that. Those mamas and dads who've been, their hands are all scrunched up and their faces are all distorted and their heads are all lopsided. I remember when my son David was born and he came out of cone head. His head looked like an oval. And I'm looking at this and I'm, and the doctor saw my face. And he said, he'll be okay. He'll be all right. Because I was going, oh my, it looks like the other side of the family. What am I going to say? <laughs> They're ugly. The C-section babies are beautiful. Because they didn't go through the trauma, right? All of you mamas who did C-section, you know that. C-section babies are beautiful. The other ones, ha. <laughs> Some of them outgrow ugly. <laughs> Others, you just get used to them. But you know, the wonder of creation, the wonder and the awe, and it really is. I mean, for that moment when the baby parts the womb and, and the doctor hands, if you're in the room, the doctor hands the baby to you and you look at the baby and your heart wells up with emotions that you didn't even know you had. And that I've had happen several times where you're just holding on to this. And it, they're always beautiful. I, I tease about that, but you know they're beautiful. They're so beautiful. I remember our firstborn, how my father-in-law was standing next to me and my daughter Corinne was laying in one of those little bassinets at Park Avenue Hospital in Pomona. And my father-in-law was standing next to me. And I'll never forget that. It was his first grandbaby. And uh, he was looking, and he's, you know, he, was, he was one of those, those grandfathers that just really, he was bursting. In, he was bursting. I, and he was, oh, she's beautiful, David. Look at her. Isn't she beautiful? And I'm looking at this ugly baby, and I'm saying, <laughs> you know, I'll get your glasses, Grandpa. She'll outgrow that. But, you know, you're looking, and, you, and there, there is a wonder. There really is a wonder of creation. Sometimes my wife and I in the morning will be um, early when the sun has is, is been up a little while, but not too much, not too long. There'll be times when Marie and I will look at one another and we'll say, look how beautiful this is. Look how beautiful this day is. You guys ever do that? Just take a moment to appreciate, you know how they say, smell the roses to do that. Just to just sit down and relax for a moment and think of the wonders of creation. You know, creation speaks. There's a designer. Creation speaks. Every house is built by some man. There's a designer, an architect, and a builder. And he who built all things, the writer of Hebrews says, is God. God is in control. And God can be known by his creation, not, not in a salvific way, not in a way of being saved, but, but, but to become aware that there is something greater than myself. And, and so that's what he's pointing to. In Deuteronomy 10, 14, the writer says, Behold, the heavens, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's, your God. The earth also, with all that therein is. Psalm 24, verse 1, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. And once again, Psalm 89, verse 11, The heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. As for the world and the fullness thereof, you have founded them. And that's what Job is saying. Speak to the earth. It'll teach you. The fish of the sea will explain to you. Who among all these doesn't know that the hand of the Lord has done this? There is a God, and he's saying you see the witness of creation. So if you would speak to nature, nature would reveal that God is absolute ruler. In verse 10, he goes on to say, in whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. God is all powerful, he's saying. God has absolute power. He gives life and he takes it away. He gives life and he gives health when it pleases him, but he also takes it away if he desires. And he's saying his ways are deep 
and cannot be understood. In verse 11, does not the ear test words and the mouth taste its food? The wise man does not accept everything he hears and he doesn't like everything he tastes. There's discernment. And these things call for discernment. We need to be able to distinguish what is true and what is false. And he's saying, you men have not exercised this discernment because you are charging me with sin. Verse 12, wisdom is with aged men and with length of days understanding. Why should I listen to you if you don't speak with wisdom? The natural way for, for us to gain wisdom, and that's what he's saying, wisdom is with aged men, length of days understanding. The, the natural way for us to gain wisdom is, is it's a process normally that occurs over many years. It's not until they've grown old that they can qualify for being wise. In the Old Testament as well as the New, there is a, there is a presentation of the fact that wisdom is with the aged. That if a man's ways have pleased the Lord and he's lived a lifetime of serving God, that, that is a person that ought to be respected and listened to when it comes to counsel. It, it's, it's like if, if you have to go to the doctor and you have a particular illness that is greatly concerning to you and you need a specialist and you have an option, you can go to a doctor who has been a specialist in that field for 25 years, who has a lot of experience in that area, is known for being able to, to deal with the thing that is concerning you. You have that option. Should I go to somebody with that many years of experience and all, or should I go to somebody who just graduated from med school? And the average person, not all, but the average person, would probably say, I want to go with experience. And we do that in life, don't we? I mean, if you go and you have your car needs to be worked on, you want somebody who knows mechanical things, somebody who's got experience. You want somebody who comes with recommendations, somebody that can be trusted. You're going to go to that person, not somebody who says, well, you know what? Um, I, I don't know much, but I got a wrench. You're not necessarily going to go to that guy. And so in life, and here's something that, now, I could speak about for a while, but I'm not going to. I'll just say this. I think one of the mistakes that I made as a young man that I've learned since then was the mistake of thinking I already knew what somebody else was saying and trusting my friends over the advice of those who had been there before me. My friends had become my counselors. Young people like myself would say things I agreed with. And so, naturally, I wanted to do the things that they would say. But would I go to my parents and ask them for advice? Would I go for, to, for advice from an older person? No, I, 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 I didn't do it. I would speak to people who were just as immature and inexperienced as me. And a lot of people do that to this day. It's even worse today than when I was younger, because when I was younger, we didn't Google all the answers. We weren't you know, Google geniuses. So somebody has a question and what they do is this, they just go online and they, they look up something that agrees with what they already pre presuppose and then they add that to their arsenal of argument. And what we also have today is we have people who are not willing to listen to another side of an argument because they've already made up their mind that the popular argument is the right one and that happens too. Now that's not, not new. We've We've all done that. If all of my friends agree that this is right, then to me it's right. That's the way it's always been. But it's much more now. It's more magnified now. And so people are quicker to agree with those whom they already have agreed with in their own mind. It's a wise thing to hear the other side. It's a wise thing to let somebody else present their case so that you can hear the other side of the argument and that way you can make a better decision as it relates to that. And when you're afraid to hear the other side of an argument, that's not good. You know, when I went to college, and I went to college for a number of years, I didn't get a degree, but I went for years. And as I went for years, I, I, I took a lot of classes, a lot of units, and, 
And, and I have 137 uh, lower division units. I have 30 some or higher in master's division. I just never have gotten my, my, my diplomas. I never did. I just went to school for, for a number of years. And I learned over time. I learned to listen. I learned to hear another side so that I could weigh what I believed with what somebody else believes. I wasn't threatened by it. I wasn't afraid of it. I wanted to hear it because I wanted to make sure that what I believed was right. But guys, today, that's not happening. Today, we just believe what somebody told us and we don't investigate for ourselves. Listen, if you want to grow and you want to be deep, you got to hunt. You got to search. It's like a treasure. You dig for knowledge. You go after it. Read Proverbs 2. You'll see what I'm saying. It has to be like a treasure that's hidden that you go after, you work for, you dig deep into it, and then you become wise. And so if a person has been following the Lord for a while and has integrity and, and has a reputation for that, that's a person that you probably can listen to. Wisdom is with aged men, verse 12 again, with length of days, understanding. And so the natural way, again, for men to gain wisdom is a process of many years. And the natural way is to just grow and experience. But of course, it depends on what the person's life has been built on that determines whether or not they have wisdom. Because there are those who grow old, but never grow wiser. There's that old saying, there's no fool like an old fool. Job 32.9 says, great men are not always wise nor do the aged always understand justice. So it depends on the direction you went in your life as to whether or not you're gaining the proper kind of wisdom. But wisdom is with aged men. Verse 13, now I'm going to read verses 13 through 25 and take it as a whole. And I'm only going to do this chapter. Job says, with him are wisdom and strength. He has counsel and understanding. If he breaks the thing down, it cannot be rebuilt. If he imprisons a man, there can be no release. If he withholds the waters, they dry up. If he sends them out, they overwhelm the earth. With him are strength and prudence. The deceived and the deceiver are his. He leads counselors away plundered, makes fools of the judges. He loosens the bonds of kings, binds their waist with a belt. He leads princes away plundered and overthrows the mighty. He deprives the trusted ones of speech and takes away the discernment of the elders. He pours contempt on princes, disarms the mighty. He uncovers deep things out of darkness, brings the shadow of death to light. He makes nations great and destroys them. He enlarges nations and guides them. He takes away the understanding of the chiefs of the people of the earth and makes them wander in a pathless wilderness. They grope in the dark without light. He makes them stagger like a drunken man. So in verse 13, with him are wisdom and strength. He has counsel and understanding. In other words, he is constantly wise. He doesn't have more wisdom later on. He's simply saying with him, he is always wise. He is always powerful. He always has proper counsel. He always has understanding. He's not growing in any of these things. When he says in verse 14, if he breaks the thing, it cannot be rebuilt. If he imprisons a man, there can be no release. He's simply saying nothing can withstand him. If he withholds the waters, they dry up. If he sends them out, they overwhelm the earth. He is the God of nature. He controls nature. He controls the rain. He nourishes the ground with the rain. With him are strength and prudence. The deceived and the deceiver are his. So he is strength and wisdom. He not only plans, but he brings his, his plans to fruition. He, he makes sure that his plans succeed, but he also frustrates the evil plans of the deceiver. In verse 17, he leads counselors away plundered and makes fools of the judges. Those who are wise on the earth cannot resist him and cannot escape him. 
He loosens the bonds of kings. He binds their waists with a belt. Verse 18, kings rule or are taken captive by his will. He leads princes away plundered and overthrows the mighty. He rules everything, the priestly class. Everything is under his lead. He, verse 20, he deprives the trusted ones of speech. And this one's interesting how it says he takes away the discernment of the elders. He can, he can prove those who are elders and should be wise. He can prove that they are actually foolish because of his ways. He's able to reveal those who are not truly wise, that only appear wise. In verse 21, he pours contempt on princes, disarms the mighty. Princes and warriors are nothing to him. He uncovers deep things out of darkness, brings the shadows of death to light. He reveals secret things that men have hidden. He reveals the secret plottings of those who would oppose him. He makes nations great, destroys them, enlarges nations, guides them. Yeah, and he's done that for us too, hasn't he? He makes nations great. It's been said that America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases being good, America will cease being great. And I agree with that. I believe that's true. That took place back in the 1700s in the formation of the United States. And a French individual was here and he was observing this birth of, uh, of this great nation. He said the secret of that nation's power is the thundering of righteousness that emanates from America's pulpits. He said that the ministers were preaching righteousness. And because people were going to church and hearing the message and living in a proper way, at least much more then than they do now, he was saying that's its secret of, of greatness, its goodness. The secret of the United States in its greatness has always been in its goodness. And even to this day, guys, even to this day, there are so many things that we disagree with, all of us as believers we see, and it disturbs us, many things. But there are still, there are still people who care. There are still loving people. There are still tender-hearted people. There are still generous people. There are still charitable people. There, there are still people with hearts. We still see that. Is this nation what we want it to be right now? No. Can it be? Yes. How is it going to become that way through the preaching of the gospel? That's how it comes. It's not the transformation from one president to another. It's the transformation of a person's heart so he becomes or she becomes someone else, a new creation in Christ Jesus. That's why I think it's wise for us, as, for me as a pastor teacher, to always try and direct us in, 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 in the path towards God and righteousness. That's why I do that. So that, that we, can, we, can, we can have a nation that actually could be called good. But it's God who makes that nation great. Verse 23, he makes nations great, but he also destroys them. He enlarges nations and he guides them. He takes away the understanding of the chiefs of the people of the earth and makes them wander in a pathless wilderness. When he says that, he's making it very clear that, that he can undermine the strength of those who are the chiefs, if you will. He, he leaves them wandering in confusion. It says in verse 25, they grope in the dark without light. He makes them stagger like a drunken man. That God is in control of everything. And even those who are considered to be great and leaders are still under his guiding hand and under his authority. And that's why, and I'll close with this, and that's why we believers need to first and foremost make sure that our trust and our hope is in the Lord. It always has to start there. I, I know I'm speaking to the choir. I know you guys know this. But that's what I really believe with all of my heart, that uh, what's going to make this nation a great nation once again is going to be when the people fear their God, worship their God, serve their God, when this nation turns to, to her God. You know, we're always saying in our national day of prayer, you know, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven and forgive them their sins and, and heal their land. We have a tendency of speaking that scripture out and we popularize it in our prayer meetings. But, but the key is, is that we need to 
confess our sins and turn from our wicked ways. And that's when the healing's going to come, guys. When we turn back to the Lord, when we realize how great God is and how sinful we are, how merciful he is and how in need of mercy we are. When we understand that, then we live humble lives. And that gives us the ability to not be like Job's comforters, self-righteously arguing your point to make your point instead of caring for hurting people. And so the church needs to wake up right now, I think. I think it has been asleep for a while, but we, Paul says to the Ephesians, waken and Christ will shine on you. We need to wake up right now so that the light of Christ might shine on us and shine through us. We really do. We really do.